Aloha. I'm so happy you've come to the podcast today to hear this wonderful conversation we're going to have with Candace Smiley. This podcast is going to be a little bit different than what you've heard on my other shows because what I work with is grief and loss. And most of the podcasts I've done so far have had to do with grieving when a loved one dies, where Candace's uh, story is a little bit different than that, where she mostly dealt with loss and came up shining from it. So I'm uh, anxious to let you hear her story and what she has to say. So uh, how would you like to start, Candace? What would you like to tell us about you? I know I just want to first you know say thank you so much for having me as a guest on your show I'm I'm just stoked the the grief part of my my story um you know you're right it's not necessarily in terms of losing um you know someone in that way but there was a, a loss and I think it's important because I can remember thinking to myself last year as is the, the pain and the grief of, you know, releasing a relationship and, and dealing with some of those things was, was hitting me. And I was like, this is going to change me. And um, so I'm excited to be able to, you know, share that uh, with people. And uh, I hope I'm coming up shining. I'm certainly working to, to <laughs> transition, you know, from that grief and use it and use it powerfully for good. I, I think uh, one of the things I like about your story the most is the hope. Because a lot of times when people are dealing with loss or dealing with grief, they think this is it. This is the way it's going to be forever. And they, they don't see that they can move forward or, mm -hmm. or can um, smile <laughs> again. <Yeah. laughs> it, laughing about that because of your name, Smiley. Yeah. But <laughs> it, it's uh, wonderful to be able to feel that you can smile again. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm anxious for you to tell us uh, what happened and then what you did about what happened. For sure. And I mean, I think... Um... You know, if we go all the way back, my story started and it was, I had an amazing childhood, um, you know, fairly sheltered, grew up with people that were very close to me. Um, and it wasn't until I hit, you know, 17-ish that the first of the the grief, I guess, you know, sort of hit in my life. And then I, I feel like I lost my innocence and there was a, a mourning period, certainly for me in coming to terms with, you know, who that self-belief about who we are, right? Which can totally rock you to your core when you, you realize or, you know, something happens and you lose an element of that. And so that was certainly a, a huge part of it um, was the start. And then because I didn't really do any healing around that, and I often say like I was 17. And so A, I didn't know how to discuss, you know, the sexual assault that had happened. I didn't know how to discuss that loss of, you know, innocence or who I you know perceived myself to be that I just sort of kept covering it up and trying to pretend to be okay. I just wanted to be okay. I wanted to prove to myself that I was okay. I would have said at the time I wanted to prove to everybody else that I was okay, but the reality was that I wasn't okay in here. And so I, I stopped singing. That was a huge part of my life. I wanted to go on and be an entertainer. Um, I love to, you know, be actively involved in my community. I grew up in a small farming community. So we did everything right with other people. And I just stopped doing those things. I, I really stopped living um, from a place that felt very authentic um, to me. And I, I do still mourn that girl because there was a lot of things I would have done <laughs> if it hadn't happened. Um, and then of course, I just sort of limped along. Uh, I limped along into other relationships. I limped along into other ideas and, and sort of just kept repeating a number of, of fairly um, traumatic patterns, right? Kept choosing people that would continue to hurt me. So I just kept hurting myself. And I used to say, you know, at some point I won't be in university and so I can stop and do some healing. At some point I won't have a job and bills to pay and so I can stop and do some healing. And I never really stopped. I, I did do some healing. I had some great psychiatrists. I had some great people. Uh, you know, I'm a self-development junkie. So if there was a book, I was reading it, right? And if there was a you know person I could go see, I was there, right? Tony Robbins showed up. I wanted to go and see him live, right? Like I was just, I was looking and seeking at all times. One of the number one things that I think made a big difference for me is that I'd always loved writing. And after the assault, I felt like I couldn't speak anymore. Uh, you know, couldn't sing, couldn't, you know, vocalize very much. And, but I could still write. And so that was often better way for me to communicate was to, to write it out and to journal it out and really put those thoughts down on paper. And so that was very therapeutic and has sort of been a, a part of my healing all the way through is that I couldn't always be honest about what I was feeling outwardly, but I could on those pages. And, um, 
you know, fast forward a few years ago, well, my base last year when the whole world shut down um, and finally hit the end and, and the real, I don't know. I mean, it was grief for me because the relationship that fell apart was one I had really felt like this was it, right? I'd worked really hard to be good with myself and attract a great person into my life. And then to realize internally that I needed to say no to it and walk away from it felt like I was the one who was doing the grief, but it was a good thing. I was like, how is this possible? And yet it hurt so bad. And I think a lot of it was, I just realized I finally needed to stop and grieve all of the small traumas that I hadn't taken the time to feel sad about because I'd always been like, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm moving on. And the reality was I wasn't fine. Not really. Right. I was really limping along. And so when I finally did the work, uh, it was 14 weeks of intense therapy um, to deal with some of those things and just keep going back and going back and going back to find this, this place of peace that I find myself at, at now. And that's, as you spoke, I'm, I'm so amazed at how similar our stories are that um, I always like to write. And when I was sexually assaulted, uh, when I was, I think, 16 years old, um, I, I just shut down. It, it was a, a situation where the person was arrested. And when the DA came to interview with me, my father was with me. And as I started to say something, my father said, if I ever get my hands on that man, I'm going to kill him. And that was not my father's personality, but I knew I couldn't say anything else. And I just shut down. I didn't tell anybody anything about what happened. Actually, I was 15. Uh, and the guy pled guilty because it, all they charged him for was statutory rape. And he thought he'd get off easy on that. Uh, and it, it affected the whole rest of my life. I, I couldn't talk. I made decisions based on that. I was always afraid somebody would find out. Right. And I, I didn't write about it because I thought somebody would see what I wrote. Somebody would find it and find out what really happened. And I would, I would be destroyed. And I just couldn't deal with that. And I, I ended up moving. I was in a small farm town <laughs> and I ended up uh, going away to college just as soon as I got out of high school to get as far away from that as possible where nobody knew what had happened to me and I could start becoming my authentic self again. But I made lots of decisions that were based on that fear and not being able to let go of that fear. And I didn't even think about grieving it at the time. I figured that I was stuck with this forever. And it took me years to be able to get along that. And writing actually was what brought me around. I had, by the time I started teaching writing in, at the university level, I had a, one of the early uh, computer classrooms where the students could write on computers. And I'd gotten a grant to do that because I was so excited about it. So awesome. I was in the, in, in the room with them while they were writing because usually they don't write that you know you talk to them and they go home and write but in this case they were writing there and I was just sitting there and I said you know I'm going to write and so I started writing that story and every time they'd start writing I'd write more and more and I finally wrote enough of it that I said this is years later I can let this go it's not going to happen again I don't even know if this person's still alive or around he certainly doesn't know who or where I am at this point and so I was safe and I didn't have to let that control me. And it, it changed my life drastically when I finally got to that point. And it sounds like that's kind of what you've been through, that you've gotten to the point where you could um, breathe again. Yeah. And, and to be honest, it, it took me like, you know, 19 years to start talking about it, like openly, honestly, mm -hmm. without... Um, you know, hiding it and saying, well, I lost my innocence at 17, like, like sugarcoating it, being like, no, sexually assaulted, did not want it. Because I was so afraid. And when I started, the, one of the very first people I tried to tell about it, you're right. Um, their response was, oh, that happens to everybody, sweetie. And it shut me down completely. Mm -hmm. Because I was feeling like I was literally dying inside. Like I was like, but, 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 you know what I mean? And there was, there was nothing coming out, which I felt really bad about um, a, I had never been, um, we didn't talk about this kind of stuff mm -mm. in my house. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm a parent to a six and a half year old daughter now, and we, we do talk about lots of things, 
um, because I see how I didn't know how to say, hey, I, I'm uncomfortable, right? Uh, and of course, this person, you know, had some, uh, you know, what, what we call narcissistic tendencies. So gaslighting was happening already, which I had never even heard of that term, right? That sort of thing. Um, some guilt, some shame, right? Some things that I had, you know, it just, it's, it's really interesting to me looking back now sort of from that bird's eye view um, of what happened. But I, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to make him uncomfortable that I was uncomfortable. And that trend has certainly continued throughout my life, right? There's a number of situations, like you say, I made decisions based on why I didn't make anybody else uncomfortable, said yes to things I didn't want to do, said yes to relationships, said yes to um, a lot of different people, places and things that I would have probably actually said, uh, no, I'm uncomfortable. Can I just say no? And so that's something else I really uh, feel like is important to talk about and one of the um, individuals, uh, I actually interviewed him for my podcast and we were talking about boundaries and sexual assault and, and how, you know, if you get to the point of a sexual assault, there's usually lots of things you could have done before that, but we're not really empowering younger people to know, recognize and see those things. And so we were having what I thought was a very important conversation about mm -hmm. how not to end up there. Um, and he brought up the fact that he's like, you know, how long did it take you to talk about it? And I was like, too long. He's like, you know, there isn't, if, if it taken you at 40 years, that would have been just fine. Um, but, you know, the whole concept of, you know, if someone's listening and they're thinking, well, this happened to me and it was years ago, it still matters. And I think we need to be talking about it. It needs to be out there. And, you know, other people used it against me, right? If they did know about it, if I had help, happened to, you know, tell them about it, they would say, they would look at me differently. And I'm like, no, I'm not wounded, right? I'm not, I just, I have some scars and that's okay. Um, you know, it, I think it's made me incredibly sensitive. I think it's uh, brought a lot of empathy into my life, compassion. Um, you know, I certainly have done some amazing things because it's happened and some of the healing and, and coping mechanisms we use. And so, you know, you're right. It's, there's a really interesting thing. You said you didn't want to write about it. I wrote four journals after I finally wow. left the relationship. Yeah, four, just filled them um, with every awful detail that I could possibly remember. And I remember thinking, I'm going to live, relive this one time and then I am done. And my hope at the time was that I could, you know, bury it and forget it even happened. And of course, you know, anybody who's done any kind of healing work knows you can't bury that stuff. <laughs> it comes back up, you know, in, in surprising ways. But I did four journals and then I buried them and buried them they're, they're they're just somewhere and um it's interesting because you know part of it is you know the lessons have certainly continued to come through but I can't remember a lot of the pieces so our minds are amazing yes. like when I think back about that I'm like how did I feel for journals when I can I can remember instances and I know what happened but it's literally two years of my life and I'm like I don't it's it's in there somewhere <laughs> I'm gonna go find it so, you know, it's a powerful place to be. Okay. I, I want to tell you that we may have to take a break because I just heard the emergency uh, oh. warning things go off that something's happening. And we were expecting a storm, but I thought it wasn't going to be until later today and that, <laughs> that it wasn't going to be this big of a storm. But if those alarms are going off, I, I looked on my phone, it's not on my phone, it's coming from, from the other room where my son is out there. So if if we have to take a break, that's why. So don't be surprised. No <laughs> and we'll come, come back, back and finish. <laughs> okay, so we, we can move forward now. And uh, sorry for that interruption, but I, okay. I don't know where you're from. I'm, I'm, I'm from Maui or living on Maui. And when, when things happen like rain, it, it can be a really big deal. I love Hawaii. No, as soon as you said Aloha, I was like, ah, that's one place I'd love to live. No, I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Right now I'm actually in British Columbia. We've had quite a bit of rain out here too, but um, yeah, no, I feel you. So it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but when I heard that, I thought I better say something in case something did happen here. So uh, I, I, just, I, I just really feel what you're talking about because of the experience that I had too. And it's um, being able to talk to anybody about it is, is really hard. When I finally got to the point where I was, uh, I was in my late 20s, I had to have a hysterectomy, which was pretty early for that sort of a thing. And it, it really 
shook me. I, I didn't feel like I was through having children and I was really uh, having a hard time dealing with it. So I went to a counselor and, and it's the first time I'd been to a counselor since everything had happened. And that was over 10 years before. And finally I told her what was going on and she looked at me and she goes, that was a long time ago. Aren't you over that yet? Oh my gosh. So I didn't go back to see her. No. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing how, how many people look at things like this from a different perspective than somebody who has actually been involved in something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's certainly one of the reasons why I talk about it. Uh, you know, cause it was mask. It was a lot of, it was a lot of women for sure who said things like that, or they'd say it in passing, they'd say, well, she got that, you know, into her, you know, because of something she did or said or wore. Well, I knew I wasn't going to be in friends with those people for very long, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because it was a secret of mine, you know, or, or masculine partners who certainly use it against me when they knew about it. And mm -hmm. I think um, it certainly made me a target because I hadn't taken the time to, to deal with it rather than now where, you know, when I share it or share parts of my stories, because it certainly brought up um, elements for me where I almost, you know, did some self-harm to myself. Certainly I was living in a way that was not supportive of my beautiful self but um you know and when I'd make decisions like that then people would find out about that and then they'd be almost you know terrified I'm like no I'm not fragile mm -hmm. but I have some un unhealed pain and what's really interesting to me is when I finally did the work I finally did the work and invited uh you know the pain the trauma the shame the guilt whatever it is to sit with me right so rather than running from it or moving from it but being like you know what is part of my story it's not who I am, which is something I would have said for a long time. It's part of my story. It's part of the tapestry that makes, makes me who I am. Um, when I finally invited to hang out, what ended up happening was I was afraid that I would start crying and never stop. And I was terrified of that, that, that it felt so dark to go there. But what ended up happening was I felt a lot of relief, like a whole bunch of relief. And so I did cry, but it wasn't the pain cry. It was a relief that I, I was finally acknowledging myself. And, you know, part of the journey of the healing for me was reacquainting myself with my feminine, because I think I had been so afraid to be, a, you know, to be a woman, to be feminine. I had no trouble being, you know, the siren part of the feminine, mm -hmm. right? But for me, that was always a distraction, right? Look over here, pretty smile. And I'll figure out if you're going to hurt me right? Which isn't a great way to operate in the world, right? The world doesn't become safe. You don't feel safe. You don't feel empowered. And so when I finally started to embrace my feminine, which vulnerability doesn't have to be weakness. It's that I'm, I'm aware. I hear, I listen, I'm empathic. I'll be present um, because I can also set great boundaries and I know where my boundaries are and my boundaries are not to take, keep you out. My boundaries are to protect my beautiful energy. And so a lot of these things I had kind of understood the concepts of in terms of healing throughout, you know, the 20 years or 19 years leading up to those moments, but they really clicked for me, right? Self-care isn't just a bubble bath, bath, although those were amazing. Self-care for me means turning off my phone. Self-care means that not everybody deserves my truth. Self-care means that I'm okay to talk about these things in a way that says, you can't hurt me with it. It happened. And here's what I'm doing with it now. Here's how I'm taking a circumstance that I defined as negative, that at the time I experienced as incredibly hurtful, and this is what I'm doing with it. And so I think that's a, a really big piece for people, regardless of where they are in their journey with grief, is I, I found so much relief when I invited it to just to be part of me and to not hide it anymore from anyone or anything. Because if if they're not going to respect it or see it or honor it, they're not my people. And yes. you can unfollow, unlike, leave, walk away without any explanation, no reason required, and no, it was a complete sentence. And when I learned that, that was a game changer in terms of how I processed and have, you know, continued to, to talk about my grief. You are so wise. Uh, I'm, I just love what you're saying and it affects <clears throat> sorry people not only who are are dealing with different kinds of loss but the loss of a loved one also uh it it all kind of boils back down to the same thing is that you it's it's very important to be able to stand in your truth and express your truth and live your life authentically 
And that's like the best self-care you can do. I right? think. I, I agree. I mean, I struggled with anxiety. I struggled with suicide. I struggled with depression. I struggled with a whole bunch of things that interestingly enough are not a challenge since I've dealt with those things that I was pushing down and hiding and not dealing with and not feeling. It was like my body was literally telling me to just go take care of me. Mm-hmm. And since I have, it's it's amazing. And now if I do feel like I'm off or I have a, a down day or anxiety kicks in, I don't immediately push it away and go look for another band-aid or something to fix that, you know, restlessness or whatever it was that I used to use to self-soothe. Now I sit there and think, I'm out of integrity with myself. Where am I out of integrity? What didn't I say? What haven't I done? What have I missed? Right? What 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 is that? And it's really interesting to me that sometimes it can be something I did the, the day before, right? Somebody, I'm in a conversation with someone, they say something that I think is offside, right? And I'm like, wait, or it's not in my integrity to just accept what they just said about themselves or whatever it is. It's up to me to say, uh, wait a minute, (laughs) I don't actually agree, you know, and sometimes it takes me a few minutes or I realize I've said yes to something that I don't actually want to right down to. So after I had my first baby six and a half years ago, uh, you still wasn't great with boundaries, right? Still was trying to people please and not make people uncomfortable. And I remember feeling all I wanted to do was just be present with this tiny little being I had just brought into the world. Motherhood was such a big deal for me. I had done as much work as I possibly could at the time with what I knew at the time and who I, who I knew at the time to create, let my body be a vessel that wouldn't hopefully pass on some of these, you know, patterns that I felt like I had been passed on. Right. Because most of the women in my family love them, but are more passive aggressive, I would say, than the outward speaking. And I think that makes sense, right. Based Mm -hmm. on culture and everything else but I wanted to raise a a daughter who would speak up for herself and speak up for other people for sure. So go through that. It's the day after she's born, people want to come visit, see me, congratulate. So all really wonderful things. And all I wanted to do was just be alone with this new baby. That is it. That for me, that would have been the best self-care. And I couldn't find the courage to say, thank you, but not today. Because I've had to teach myself what I can say when I need to enforce a boundary or how I can do that. If someone calls, hey, can we come over today real quick? No, thank you, but not today. I didn't have those words. And I think it's really important that we talk about that with people if they're learning, you know, if you're going through grief or you're going through some healing, you may need to jot down some sentences that you can use. I did. <laughs> That's also self-care for me, right? Planning what I'm going to say so that I'm not deer in the headlights, um, which typically happens. Um, and so that's a, been a big thing for me is coming to that place where I can say, this is part of my, my healing today. I just need to be alone. So with this new baby, I had a new little one uh, three and a half weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Made some new plans to see some amazing people who I know love me, care about me, hold space for me, said, yes, why don't you come over, you know, a week from now, sat down and just felt off. Like I was grumpy Mm -hmm. and I was whatever. And I messaged them back and I said, I think I may have spoken too soon. I think I need more time to myself. I need more time. And thankfully these people know, right? They know me. (laughs) They've heard my story a few times. And they said, sure, when's better? And I said, I don't know. Can I tell you when I'm feeling like I'm ready, you know? And one came back and said, you know, I'm missing out. And I said, I know, I acknowledge that. And I really just need to be, you know, in my space. I'll send you some pictures later, right? And really powerful that they could feel like they could express, I don't want to miss out, right? I can hear that and no longer have to feel bad about that and can also respond with yes and thank you. And so, you know, I share that because for me, it's still a journey. And so sometimes it's two steps forward and, you know, a backpedal. Um, but I think that's really important that we're, you know, are practicing that self-care and, and guarding our, our space, whatever that healing looks like. That is really important. I, I, I love that idea of having the sentences already written down so that you can refer to them as needed. It's needed. <laughs> it's really perfect. 
Um, so yeah. I want to know what what has happened now that you it seems like in in a way you've turned a corner mm -hmm. that things are different and very much I, I want to know about uh what you want to tell me about that either about how it happened or what's different or just tell me what you want to well I think a big part of the turning of the corner and and you know I'm glad you picked up on the hope of my story because it's one of the reasons why I want to talk about it so openly is you know 17 years ago I felt like that moment unexpectedly had defined me and changed entirely the course of my life and there was quite a few years that I really grieved that life that I had planned I had big goals and big dreams and um, I cried for who that girl would never be and now on this side, it's really interesting to me how in spite of what happened, or maybe even a little bit because of what happened throughout my life, uh, I am actually living those dreams out. And coming to that awareness was huge uh, for me. You know, I wanted to be a pastor's wife. I wanted to have impact in my community. I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to communicate. I wanted, you know, I wanted to speak on stages and sing on stages and those sorts of things. Well, now I'm a podcaster, like it's what I do, but my audience is not just a small town or a small group. It's like international. And so I think, wow, that I may have ended up here anyway, <laughs> but here I am. And so who I am or who I was or who I wanted to be still came through in spite of all that. It just, you know, maybe took a little bit longer. I think it's important for people to know. Um, I really felt like when I did finally make the decision to get healed. So, you know, when I got off the floor and didn't commit suicide and made some phone calls, I can remember thinking that the idea of trying to get better or find healing or find peace, even because there was not a lot of peace in my life, be happy again. I was like, when I get happy, I'm going to laugh a lot. And it was like a promise I'd sort of made to myself. I'm going to get there. I don't know when, but when I do, I am going to laugh a lot. And I can remember the first time I laughed and really meant it. Not the, you know, polite laugh, but like belly laugh, tears running down my face. And I remember thinking, I'm getting better. And it was probably months again afterwards before that happened again. But those moments were things I would hold on to. I can remember feeling like getting over the grief and getting over those pieces of my the loss part of it coming to a place of peace about what would never be felt like lassoing the moon it felt overwhelming it felt totally out of reach but I figured if I can just hook the moon and then just hang on eventually eventually it'll be closer <laughs> yeah. and I think that's important for people who are going through something whatever their healing is about um, you will get there. There will inevitably move as you grow, but give yourself time to do so. And I, I think that was one of the biggest gifts I gave to myself without knowing it was going to be a gift is I just knew it was going to take some time. And so I didn't really rush the process. I didn't push myself. I just sort of went, I'll get there. And when I do, it's going to be awesome. As long as I just keep moving forward and you know, it was this or better, it'll get this or better, right? That sort of thing. Um, and a lot of times it was living in my mind, I'm going to pretend as if, I'm going to pretend as if, and live as if. And I think that brought a lot of relief for me. Um, and I would follow that feeling of relief. This feels better than that. This feels better than that. Um, to where I am now, where, you know, I did a lot of healing work after um, that relationship fell apart, 14 weeks, emerged re-engage with who I was quieter softer happier at peace and then I was terrified that I would you know fall back into an old pattern <laughs> and do it again right because that was a pattern I was used to and that was what a lot of people well-meaning people said they're like well you know you know you you make these choices yes yes I do but that doesn't mean I can't change right mm -hmm. um and so I learned to not talk so much about some of that stuff um, and finally started following that. So, you know, backcountry camping was a thing and partly because I couldn't travel and I love to travel. And so I traveled in my own country, which was actually kind of amazing. And through that connected with the person who's now, you know, baby daddy, we've got an amazing life. It's like my call my lifetime love. Cause I've been looking my whole life for somebody who also had done a lot of work and, um, 
you know, quiet, steady, all of those things that I had sort of been hoping for and wishing for at 17, right? Never thought I would actually attract or find or be healthy enough to have, you know, a healthy relationship where I was happy and at peace and that sort of thing. And so, you know, love came softly, peace came softly. These things didn't happen overnight. Um, but then one day you wake up and you realize you're there. As cliche as that is, you're like, oh, I'm here. Cool. And some days life's epic. <laughs> some days I'm like, nope, still do not have this figured out. You know, some days I realize scarcity is still running the show. Some days I realize, wow, I still have some grief to work through. I think the difference is now I'm no longer pushing myself to get over it. I'm not pushing myself to be my best. My best is going to change from day to day. And so if today is a day where I'm thinking about all the things that didn't happen or all the things I wish would happen or, you know, what if, could if, all that stuff, I'm just going to sit with it. I'm just going to sit with it. And that is also a great place to be when you're like, that's me today. And sometimes that means I don't do anything but that. And that's okay too. Yes, I agree. I, I always feel like uh, if I'm doing the very best that I can in, in the moment that I'm in, then that's great. I just have to recognize that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes that's a little bit of a challenge, but when I recognize that, I can kind of take a deep breath and okay, okay, I can I can do this. I can move on. I can move forward. So I I gotta know. Are you singing? I am. Oh yeah. Uh, on stages? Well, not since COVID, right? Yeah. Um, you know that sort of thing. I'm I'm eager to get back out. You know, I I love a good karaoke event. Um, you know that sort of thing. Um, 18 years classically trained, which is always fun because I can oh, go wow. out there and be like, let's do this. Right. So it's a lot of fun. Um, but I do sing a lot to, of course, the new baby. I sing a lot to uh, my six year old who also loves to sing. Um, and I got to tell you, when when I started to do it again, when I started to you know, let that out again quietly, it was an interesting feeling. And I, I've never shared this before before now, but my vocal cords felt stronger. It was as if, mm. even though they hadn't been used for a very long time and I'm classically trained. So, you know, the, some of those things take a lot of practice and effort. I remember thinking this sound is fuller. This, you know, note is warmer. This is easier to do than it was years ago. And I think a lot of it was, there was so much internal work to get to the point where I could open my mouth to speak again and speak my truth um, and speak it out loud that um, there's an interesting um, sound quality that I hear now. I think we do create our world with our word. And that's one of the reasons why my podcast is, you know, the tagline is trust the niggle, tell the truth. Because the niggle is about that thing that's off and you know it's off and you should have listened to it, right? Made the change, not gone into the relationship, whatever that is, right? It's always an inconvenient truth, but it's a total truth and you got to pay attention to it. But the tell the truth part, is I think the most important part. And it's not about telling the truth necessarily to the world because the world doesn't always deserve your truth, but you do. You deserve to be truthful and honest with yourself. And I think for a lot of us that are healing from narcissistic relationships or abusive relationships or grief or whatever that thing is that's currently defining you is you got to be honest with yourself first how you're feeling about it, what it's doing to you, where you want to go from it, like all of those things. Because when I started to be honest with myself and be in integrity with myself, everything else just shifted. It was like, you know, dominoes. It, I didn't have to do anything except to be honest here, whether that was, I'm not okay. I'm not okay today. This is going to change me. I am changed. I want different. I want more, whatever it is. That I think is the biggest um, thing that I'd love someone to know from my story is you've got to start, whether that's journaling, whether that's looking in the mirror, whether that's whispering it to nobody else but yourself. And when we start those conversations, so like leaving my marriage, when I finally looked myself in the eye and went, this isn't what I want. 
I don't know what I want, but this isn't, this isn't it, <laughs> you know? And I whispered it to my daughter, six days old. We need something different. Mommy's going to figure it out. Not today. Mommy has no idea what she's going to do, but we're going to figure it out. And then I realized by looking in the mirror, I was like, but first we need to lose 50 pounds. <laughs> wow. and, and, right. I mean, I just had baby, but I remember thinking we'll get there. But first I'm going to do this. And a big part of it was <laughs> I needed to take care of me first. And I knew that I couldn't make a big game change. I couldn't heal fully. I couldn't, you know, have the conversation that I'd need to have um, if I wasn't taking care of me. And so, and I remember thinking, I'll, I'll leave later. I'm going to do this first. And I, I like to talk about that because I think a lot of people, maybe they want to, you know, get back in the dating game if they've lost somebody or they want to, you know, remodel or whatever it is that they want to get to there might be something you need to do first to empower yourself to you know heal whatever that is so just do that thing and give yourself a break you're on nobody else's timeline but your own that's right that's that's powerful words there you made me think about when uh i was growing up i was very involved in theater everything i did had to do with theater right and it that got away from me. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s and I had gone back to school and discovered that if I changed my major to theater that I could have a full ride scholarship. And so I did, terrified to do that. But boy, once I got on stage again, it was all the difference in the world. It was like, I'm okay. It, I'm some, okay. Somehow yeah. something just opened up and I yeah. knew that I was okay. And it took that to do it. And I, I am so grateful for all the theater experiences that I've had because of that, because it, it, it changed my life. It allowed me to see who I really am again. That's awesome. That's so cool. Very cool. So it's, it's uh, very important for us to pay attention to ourselves. And I think we're always trying to please everybody else that we're not thinking what it will take to please us and enable us to go forward in the most positive way and people when yeah and when people deal with with grief a lot of times they go but i my life will never be the same and yeah your life will never be the same it's true yeah. Uh, yeah but that doesn't mean you don't have a life ahead of you that you can have and enjoy and thrive in and do some pretty cool things you just have to allow yourself to know that it's not disrespectful to whatever loss you've had to move ahead because a lot of people get in that trap, which is, is yeah. it's understandable, but it's sad. I, I hate to see that, that it, when, when we can really uh, start paying attention to ourselves and, and paying attention to our heart's desires and paying attention to the time it'll take to get where we want to go, wherever that is. And just move forward a little bit every day. A little bit every day. Yep. Every day, every day, <laughs> move forward yep. a little bit. And if you go backwards one day, that's okay. Just don't go backwards from, from more than one, right? Don't go backwards yeah. for, for longer. I can remember um, feeling like that when I was, you know, learning how to love myself and I'd, you know, have an amazing, you know, weeks or months. And then I'd have one day where I just couldn't get out of bed. And remember thinking, well, if I'm going to be in bed today, then I am going to be in bed, right? We're eating ice cream. We are falling totally off. And tomorrow, tomorrow, you are getting up and you are getting dressed and you are tackling the day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if the next day was also bad, I'm like, okay, one more day, one more day. But the point was, is that I learned to sort of accept that as well. And some mm -hmm. of those days were incredible resets. And even now, you know, I'll have a day where I'm just off and, and even my, my producer goes, yeah, but some of your best ideas come out of your off days. And I'm like, yeah, it's almost as if I need to just kind of go dark and be quiet. And I've learned that even that, which I think is a symptom of some of the old healing and dealing with some of those things is also good. There's mm -hmm. so much good in all of it. It's, it's like pushing a reset button. Yeah. And, and you really can reset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Is there, there any last things that you'd like to say before we go? 
Um, I feel like we, we covered a lot of amazing ground. And so, you know, thank you so much again for creating a space and a platform for people to um, talk about grief, to listen in about grief, because I know um, having been in it, things like this, listening to other people's stories, you know, certainly were um, shining lights for me that, you know, if they can, so can I, um, and that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And um, so I think that's really, really important. Um, and I would just say, you know what, if, you know, you're going through something or you know someone who is, maybe even that, one of the most powerful things that came up for me when I was, especially in this last um, bit of grief, were the people who just held space for me. And I know that's a term that we throw around. Um, and for me, holding space literally in my mind, it's like, you know, we're going to go into a room, you and me, I'm going to leave my phone outside, there'll be no distractions. If you want to talk, we talk. If you want to cry, we cry. If you want to sit, I will not say a thing. And um, there were some people surprising who did and who didn't, to be honest, um, through that grief. But there were people who literally would drive the hour, of, hour outside of uh, the city where I live, healing, and they would just come and sit with me. And they would just sit. And they'd be like, do you want somebody to eat? No, okay. And I didn't feel like I had to entertain them. And at first I would say things, well, I'm not really up for a visitor. Like, I'm not your visitor. I'm here to hold space. And one in particular just drove out and sat for like four hours. And I would burst into tears just having somebody there. And sometimes she'd get me a Kleenex. Sometimes she'd rub my back. Sometimes she would just sit and not do anything. And, you know, then when we felt like that was done, then she went, I'm going to go home now. And if you need me later, call me. And if not, no worries. And I remember thinking, next time somebody I know is going through a grief or a change or a transition, I am going to do this. I'm going to come and just sit and just be and let the other person define what that looks like. Um, because that amount of compassion certainly had a huge impact on me going through it so you know not just for your listeners who are going through grief with the people that maybe are watching or knowing their people are going through something it's not about them telling you the story it's about you just being there and you probably have no idea the impact of your presence oh that's so beautiful if if we could all just hold more space for each other the world would be a brighter place Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, thank you so much for all you shared and, and all the valuable wisdom that you've presented today. I, I think uh, what you say makes a difference. And I appreciate that. Thank you. So, and to my listeners, I'm so glad that you were able to hear this and that you uh, can maybe write about it some yourself. What, uh, what struck you, what you learned from this, what you can take into your life that will help ease your pain, to help you uh, move forward. And as always, I'm always here for you. And I hope to see you again next week with my next podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs>